So this is going to be a slightly different Venture Crush AV than we're used to. And I appreciate everyone indulging us in watching that video from the Asian University for Women. Um, I'd also like to ask Fatima, Kamal, Maria, and Jake to come on up and, and join us up here in, in the seats. There are a couple of ways in which it's going to be a little different, and I thought I'd lay out um, what we have in store tonight, give you a couple of announcements, and, th and then we'll start. So typically, this is a 20, 25-minute conversation. Um, tonight, we'll probably go for about 45 minutes, and I wish I had more time with each of our guests. Typically, it is a single conversation. I think we're going to have to do some of it in series. Um, this is definitely a tech event. It is definitely relevant for startup founders and venture investors. In fact, one of our panelists, we'll call them panelists, uh, raised more than $100 million. Which one of you raised more than $100 million? Not just me, if you use raise, right? You raised more than $100 million, right? Yeah. I raised more than $100 million. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. That's part of the point. And part of how you do that is access. And tonight is about access. And I'm going to read, it's also about vision, but I'm going to read uh, something that Kamal said at a talk last year at the Milken Institute. No part of society has a monopoly on talent and really shifts the needle, the Asian University really shifts the needle to focus on communities that are ordinarily bypassed by the system as not being worthy of a higher education. So we focus primarily on women who are first in their family to get to university, but who already exhibit certain qualities of leadership. They have courage, they are outraged at injustice, and they have a keen sense of empathy. That's the experiment we've been doing for the last 10 years. So I want to come back to access before we get into our discussion. We give you access by having these events, and we hope that you access the really interesting people that are sitting next to you. And after this conversation, those of you who really want to do that will be able to do that in that part of the office, in this part of the office. There will be a small number of us who, in spite of how unbelievably fascinating so many of you are, will want to hear John Tavius play his resonator, play his steel guitar. And John Tavius is an emerging blues artist with a forthcoming second album. We were turned on to him by our friend Keb Mo, because John Tavius is being mentored by both Keb Mo and Taj Mahal. Um, who respectively picked up their fourth and third Grammy Awards on Sunday. Keb Mo, who also goes by Kevin Moore, was at this event uh, last time, a couple months ago. He's a friend. He's played a number of our events. And he thought that um, after hearing Laura Marling, who was also nominated for two Grammys this weekend but didn't, didn't grab them on the way out, uh, after hearing Laura, that John Tavis would be the perfect person to play this event. So those of us who just want to listen and, and are not going to talk during that will go in that glass enclosed library where we have all of these law books that no one reads. <laughs> <laughs> but that will make it real. No, we paid for them by the pound. They look really erudite. <laughs> good. It's good. So that's where we're going to go after. That's, you should think of that as a room with as little talking as possible. Other people will mill around. You'll still hear the music outside, but we're really excited about having John Tavius here. Um, another way that we try to create access is through our Venture Crush FG program. The next one of those is in March. We have Karen Appleton. She's, I think, the sixth employee at Box and has been doing amazing things coming from San Francisco. Haley Barna is a general partner at First Round Capital co-founded Birchbox, is also an angel investor, and went through our Venture Crush program when she was starting Birchbox. Jody Jahick Sherman, who was, and I, I might get in trouble for this, a physics major at Pomona. Is that okay? Mm -hmm. She's a partner at uh, a venture fund called Align VC in San Francisco, and she's flying in for it. And Amanda Hesser, who was also a CEO in First Growth, or in Venture Crush FG, um, which used to be called First Growth. She has a great company called Food 52, 
Um, she's also a James Beard award-winning author and was the food editor for the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine and played herself in a major motion picture. So that's who's on tap for, for that event. Um, the next one of these is June 6th. Before that, in San Francisco, on April 26th, Venture Crush SF. I'm sorry, Venture Crush SF, April 26th in San Francisco. And you'll be able to access the pool of capital and talent sitting in San Francisco and our big annual event here in New York on July 12th. Um, I also want to note that uh, I wanted to call out two of my colleagues in particular, and I'm sort of scanning the room for them. Anne Milgram is around someplace, and Anne was the Attorney General of New Jersey under John Corzine and has been helping a number of our, of our clients with data breaches and policy issues and other uh, big problems. She splits her time between here and NYU Law, where she's a professor, and her actual cool jobs as the technical legal advisor to Law and Order SVU. <laughs> and Orange is the New Black. But she really, you know, she really loves this more. <laughs> um, and Chris Perino, we're thrilled, has rejoined us, and he's sitting in, standing in the back wearing a suit. You can tell he's not in our group. Um, <laughs> until a week and a half ago, Chris was the Attorney General of New Jersey under someone other than Corzine. <laughs> so, and, and, and Chris uh, comes back to chair our litigation department, which is a position that he held before he left to work for someone other than Corzine. And we're thrilled to have him back because he's been a friend for many years and has been a partner here for many years. And I think that um, what we're going to do is we'll talk like in series for a little bit. I've got a couple of slides which we're not going to be able to see because this is the tech group and the technology can't work that back screen. <laughs> but now that we've proven that we have access on both sides of the aisle with Ann and Chris, I'd like to welcome you in particular by saying the phrase that I really had hoped to say so often this year. Welcome, Madam President. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, your, 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 quick, um, your quick background, uh, you want to talk a little bit about it. And we've also got some, some slides to show your background. But you were grouped away by Harvey Mudd when you were the Dean of Engineering and Applied Science at a local New Jersey school. Yep. And how, how long had you been there? I, I lasted there. I got out early for good behavior. <laughs> <laughs> I lasted there three and a half years. I got to say, I, I went to be Dean of Engineering at Princeton, having been Dean of Science at the University of British Columbia. And you cannot imagine the culture shock. So think, you're moving from Canada to the US, from the West Coast to the East Coast, from a large public University to the Ivy League, and from Dean of Science to Dean of Engineering. I, uh, I, was, I felt really lucky that I actually got those three and a half years. It was an amazing three and a half years. I learned a ton. Uh, we, the biggest thing we did while I was there is we created a strategic plan. And um, one of the things about creating that strategic plan was I had to find a way to get the faculty to want to do it. Now, those of you who don't work in a university, you don't understand you can't tell faculty to do anything. Doesn't matter if you're the president, doesn't matter if you're the dean, you can't. And uh, it turned out the previous dean of engineering had done a strategic plan that no one liked. And, and, but I had to get them involved because that was going to be what caused uh, in the School of Engineering to be the largest part of the next campaign for Princeton. And so uh, working with a number, of, about five other people, including uh, a couple of faculty, uh, one of whom became the Dean of Engineering at Yale, and I have just heard is completing nine years in her term now. Um, the other one is now um, in charge of the Dean of Graduate Studies at, well, actually, he's not. He just became the Dean of the Faculty. He was the Dean of Graduate Studies. Um, we put together the strategic planning process, and the one thing I can say is that when I said I was leaving to go to Harvey Mudd, and I had no intention of leaving to go to Harvey Mudd, it was one of these just bizarre things, but when it actually came to pass, the six department chairs walked into the president's office and said, you can't hire an external dean because this is our strategic plan, it's not Maria's strategic plan, 
And if you hire somebody from the outside, they want to create a new one, and we're doing this one. And for the first time, I think probably ever, they hired an internal candidate, Vince Poor. They stayed for uh, 12 years after I left. Well, actually, 12 years after it was announced, 10 years after I left on the same strategic plan. And now they have their second female dean of engineering ever. It's Emily Carter. She's absolutely fantastic. She again was an internal uh, choice. And they're just now, 14 years later, thinking about you know, tweaking strategic plan. So that was my that was the thing I'm most proud of at Princeton is that you know we really and of course it won't surprise you that one of the major themes in the strategic plan was diversity. <laughs> <laughs> we might you know I wasn't planning on talking about diversity, but since you mentioned it, we might get there a little later. Okay. Um, so I, I want to talk a little bit about this uh, photograph. Um, and sorry about stra straining your neck. You you spent six years, I think, almost on, seven years. On which is six, right? Almost seven to six. No. I mean, you're the math person. Almost seven is almost seven. It's way bigger than six. <laughs> it's almost one away from six. <laughs> I am unworthy. So you spent six or seven years on the board of Microsoft. Um, and I, I want I want to hear a little bit about what you learned being uh, and and you ended your tenure December thirty one of fourteen or fifteen. Uh, fifteen. It's almost or exactly two years ago. Yeah. So the first thing is this is my first corporate board, and you might think it's a little bit weird that when you're on your first public corporate board, it happens to be Microsoft. And do you want to know how I got on that board? I think, it, I think it's safe to tell you now. OK, so <laughs> I have a very good female friend who was at Microsoft in research. Some of you might even know her. I won't give her name, just you know, I like to be careful. We're not recording this, are we? Sure we are. Oh, crap. OK, anyhow, <laughs> I had said to this friend, you know, I really need to spend more time around Bill Gates. And the reason is, what do presidents do? You stock billionaires. <laughs> I mean, really and truly, because you're constantly trying to raise money for your institution. Yeah, watch out, Jake. <laughs> I think I still stock billionaires, too. So. <laughs> so I wanted to spend more time with Bill. And in fact, that person was one of the people who suggested me to interview Bill at their faculty summit. So I did that. But you know, I sort of said after that, you know, I really need to spend more time with them. And so what that person did was suggest to Bill and to Steele Ballmer that they really should get an academic computer scientist on the Microsoft board. And it would be great if it was someone who'd done a lot of strategic planning. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, if it could be a woman who was maybe president of a well-known college or university, that would be an extra plus. Well, guess how many female computer scientists are president of a college or university in the United States? Is, is she also Canadian? She is also Canadian, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so that's how it happened. And well, the reason we have to be careful about this is both Steve and Bill thought it was their own idea. They thought, they thought it was their own idea? That they needed a female academic computer scientist on the board. <laughs> so we shouldn't like tweet that or anything. No. Okay. <laughs> Don't worry about that. I think we're good. Um, and and for the strategic planning process that you did at Harvey Mudd, um, this is a picture of your door um, with you. This is uh, we were talking about this earlier with some of the founders in the uh, Venture Crush FG program. Well, I just want to note that all of these photos are intentionally plagiarized copyright from whatever sources I swipe them from <laughs> using. But he asked me to send technology. photos. So, I'm going, photos? Yeah. Why would you want photos? Well, I was, I was worried that you wouldn't be an interesting speaker. So you there know, you I go. Mean, <laughs> um, so, uh, so this is a New York Times profile of you. And I love that your door says, please enter. Um, because you know this is relevant to our conversation about um, you know, I never noticed that. <laughs> really? Really? 
that's embarrassing. <laughs> for me or for you? <laughs> for both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Next time, just move it. Just. Um, so, but that's actually my old office, so I haven't seen that door for a very long time. We moved into the new building in 2013. The article was in 2012. So there's a reason why I don't remember. So have you now taken it off and it now says yes, abandon don't all hope? Yeah, exactly. exactly. <laughs> Nobody welcome. Do you learn to skateboard at the age of 60? No, you know, I was younger than that. Mm -hmm. A lot younger? Thinking, no. Let's see. So I'm now 66. So I was actually 55. Almost 60 by your math, right? Yeah, yeah, clearly. <laughs> and, okay, okay, so here's the deal. I sort of always wanted to skateboard. And we did the strategic planning thing at MUD. We did it faster than we did it at Princeton, but it was also a great success, very similar format. And after we finished the last strategic planning workshop, I went to a skateboard shop and said, I want to buy a skateboard. And they look at me and they said, who's it for? And I said, me. And they go, do you know how to skateboard? And I go, no. Well, let's start with the pads first. <laughs> so I bought a helmet, knee pads, hip pads, wrist pads, elbow pads. I think there were more. And you can just imagine what I looked like on campus. And after four years of practice, I got to the stage on my skateboard that was equivalent to what our students get to after two weeks after they arrive. But that Halloween, you know, maybe the next Halloween, there was a student who dressed up as me. She told me she dressed up as me for Halloween. And I said, so, I mean, she's got long hair. She's like 18 years old. I'm going like, how'd you do that? And she says, I got a helmet, I got pads, I got my skateboard, I got the t-shirt. You, you, you wear that t-shirt with regularity. I you wear, wear You wear this one, I, I've heard. Well, I used to wear that one until I got this one, right? So I wore that for probably a couple of years. And then students got, started complaining. Well, worse, it used to say never. And they started complaining that everyone had heard of us now. So we changed it to ever. So we got another set of t-shirts. But this is actually my favorite because, you know, I wear it absolutely everywhere. I mean, there, there really are probably a half dozen times a year when I don't wear it. I, I have more than one. <laughs> <laughs> in, in fact, I have 20. Do you have a single drawer that just only has yes, Harvey Mudd t-shirts in it? I do. I absolutely do. Would you, would you license this? To Kamal, <laughs> Kamal, do you do you have what? What do you think? Most amazing university? No, could be the most trash ever heard of, <laughs> ever existed, something ever like that. existed, something <laughs> like that. Yes, founded in Bangladesh. Yeah, yeah I think it would be in good century? in this what century. And then yes, yeah, we can do not? that. All right, we can work out that deal. I want to talk about the number seventeen. For oh, number seventeen. Okay, you, so you got to do this. So, so okay, but but wait. First, there's your picture. Oh. And you, you said at a speech that I watched um, with great enthusiasm, I get up every morning feeling like a total failure. Yeah, I do. And, and I want to, yeah, no, that's good. Well, we'll see about tomorrow. Um, so I want to know, because you feel like a failure, were you disappointed when in 2015 Fortune magazine I think. came out with their list of the 2014. Oh, yeah. We're going to do a math thing all night. Yeah, we are. Um, 2014, world's 50 greatest leaders. You were only 17, so you were behind Pope Francis, Angela Merkel, Warren Buffett, <laughs> the Dalai Lama, Jeff Bezos, and of course, we're in New York, Derek Jeter, and <laughs> the, in, the football inflation dude in Boston was not on the list. And uh, you were sandwiched between Jack Ma of Alibaba and Ken Cheneau of Amex. Is that the sort of feeling like a failure? That I had in mind. Okay, so I got to tell you. So I'm sitting in Sun Valley, and I'm on a phone call actually with actually the PBS station here in, in New York City. And my laptop is open, and they were interviewing me about something. I can't remember what it was. And the stuff starts flashing across my screen about being number 17 on the world's greatest leader list. And I'm on like, I guess, so I didn't mention it while I was on, while I was in the interview, but I got off and I went and I looked at it. I had no idea it was gonna happen. 
So that afternoon, I'm riding up a ski lift, and I see uh, uh, somebody who thinks I'm a really crappy skier, which I used to be a really crappy skier, but I've been practicing. I started taking lessons when I was 59, so I started skiing. Seriously? Yeah, yeah. So anyhow, so Brett Duder is giving me a hassle about my skiing, and I said, Brett, you are talking to the number, the 17th greatest leader in the world. <laughs> and he says, I am not. And I said, yes, you are. Go check. Okay. So later, my daughter, who, um, so I will just, can I brag about my daughter for a second? Yeah. Okay. She has her dream job. It is the United Nations lead in the Central African Republic. And she's leading the peace process. Which is really, she's almost 33, uh, which is pretty cool. But anyway, uh, my entire life, nothing I do impresses Sasha. Like, nothing. I mean, it's sort of like, when she's 17, she goes, like, Mom, you think what you do is important? All the stuff about women in science and engineering? It's not. I'm going to do something important with my life. And I go, like, so what are you going to do, Sasha? And she goes, I'm going to work in developing countries. And I'm going to work on things that really matter, like peace and health care and so anyhow, Sasha sends me an email, and she goes, Mom, you beat Angelina Jolie. <laughs> and I go, yeah, but I lost out to the Pope and the Dalai Lama. <laughs> he emails me back immediately. She says, Mom, they're old. You have a chance to catch up. <laughs> so yeah, that was very cool. So I found out how it happened, right? I mean, it's one of these things. So they wanted somebody in the list who would represent women in tech. And I was an easy person for them to pick because if they picked somebody from a particular company, that would be sort of like biasing it towards something. But Harvey Med College, who could have possibly object? Nobody ever heard of it. <laughs> well, your daughter sounds deeply substantive and yet Angelina Jolie, and that's perfect. That's exactly the way that it should be. Um, so. <laughs> I, I want to actually um, move to Jake for, for a minute. I'm not going to show a slide for this. Um, Thank you. But <laughs> I do. I have a couple of pictures of you. I'm sure you do. <laughs> um, Thanks for not using them. I'll get to some later, but okay. we'll keep it clean. So uh, I couldn't help but notice that this morning, uh, Reuters. <laughs> Did everyone hear the groan? <laughs> this morning, Reuters reported that General Assembly, the company that you co-founded and run, is in a sale process with bankers and is being valued at just under $500 million. Do you want to comment on that? Oh my god. Huh? First off, aren't you my lawyer? So, like, <laughs> I was young. Um, <laughs> we've got time. All is possible. So that's a no comment. That is a no comment. All right. Is that what you said to Reuters too? Um. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not your lawyer. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Uh, yeah. I mean, I think it, we could have a deeper conversation on the role of the media and the responsibility of the media, but. Not right now. That sounds like a terrific topic for some other event. Exactly. Yeah. Are you saying it was fake media? I, I would not use the phrase fake news because the connotations would reflect poorly on me. <laughs> <laughs> wow, if only that were the standard. So, um, <laughs> so General Assembly, um, a performance space on 42nd Street um, that you probably did illicit things in and, and ran or co-ran. Uh, you were a VC or a private equity guy for a little while. And, and did nothing. And, and yeah. did you get? Did you do nothing? Pretty much. Um, so I had gone to business school, um, and I wanted to start. This was 2007. A crowdfunding company because I'd heard about this guy in England who had crowdfunded a soccer team, and then it was managed by the collective. I thought that was a really cool idea. And I wanted to apply it to big budget television shows, because I was obsessed with 
the fact that Arrested Development got canceled, and I didn't understand why. You should bring that, someone should bring that back. Well, so interesting story. So first off, I didn't do it because um, it was, the, the world was starting to fall apart. This was like 07, 08, and I got scared. Um, interesting to note, though, that the Kickstarter guys literally also had the inspiration of Arrested Development, and David Cross was one of their first investors. Um, which I found later, which I found both validating and highly depressing. Um, so I didn't do that, and I, I instead um, worked at a, I got an offer from a company that I had done some work for one of their portfolio companies, and by the time I had joined, uh, the financial crisis was in full swing. Uh, you know, Lehman, I think, collapsed like a month later, and I threw a lot of, you know, I could get into the details of how private equity firms work, but needless to say, they weren't really going to do any new deals. And so I kind of sat around as in, in, a, in a time in the world where you could literally, there were so many interesting things to invest in at really reasonable prices because of that. But because everybody thought the world was going to end and nobody really had access to any money, um, it became uh, really hard to get any of that done. And so I ended up spending a lot of my time with our existing portfolio companies uh, who were really struggling. And I met a lot of interesting entrepreneurs who were and in probably the darkest time of their sort of journey as entrepreneurs. And it, it had a big impact on me and taught me a lot, but it also taught me that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. And that was really my, my true uh, calling. And I, I ended up leaving sort of deciding that, um, you know, even though I'd gone to business school, I was going to be okay living in a gutter as long as I never had a boss again. And um, I ended up sort of, you know, I did a bunch of stuff. I, I always left, I, I hustled for consulting work. I spent a day of the week kind of working on stuff for myself. That was what I saved a day of the week for myself. And a bunch of interesting projects came out, you know, came out of it that I thought were gonna be hugely successful. Um, one I was doing, because I just thought it was interesting, was helping uh, a very young uh, graduate of Yale that I, I met at a Yale Entrepreneur Networking event who had this idea for a sort of clubhouse for his friends who were all doing startups. And that uh, you know, became this idea called Superconductor that eventually became this idea called General Assembly. Um, and, and we had this little room that we sort of thought would be funny to call it a classroom because we're sort of branding it as an urban campus. And then we started to run classes out of it and they were selling out like crazy. And it reminded me of some of the stuff in my earlier youth around how hard of a time I had had transitioning from college to the real world. And, and sort of wandering in the desert of figuring out who I was, what my career was going to be. Um, and I, I always sort of thought that that was such a shame of a moment because I was willing to work so hard and was just looking for that purpose. And you should have just come to Harvey Mudd. I know, but so the problem is when I was an undergrad, um, you know, because of the way I was taught in high school, by the time I got to college, I decided I hated math and science. And I didn't realize that I actually loved it until my mid-20s when I had sort of wandered around, found my way into this weird corner of finance, got kind of geeked out on statistics and realized that like it was far better than a, the, a way of describing the world than everything I had learned in American studies <laughs> in college. And, um, but by that point, I was sort of on my way. And so I ended up going back to business school to sort of try to like reformulate my career. And it was at that point that I realized that um, most of the people in my program were just like me, and they were um, sort of what I, I, I use this phrase, lost and lonely in the world of work. And it's not that they, and, and a lot of these people actually had all the advantages of life, kind of, kind of like I did, but, but the system just didn't make sense. It didn't really, it was sort of, and, and, and my business school, it, I realized, was sort of a, a toll collector in between um, these sort of lost and lonely 20-somethings looking for some next level of their career, and companies who were more than happy to sort of uh, get free access to a, a pool of sort of vetted candidates on the recruiting side. And yeah. So I, I don't, I, I'm trying to connect the dots from how this like, let's have a hangout room in New York for people from oh, Yale. I'll, I'll get there, I'll get there. To, <laughs> let's solve the skills gap. I, I was, you just interrupted me as I was get, pulling all the threads together. <laughs> it was unclear. Okay. Yeah, it was unclear. Well, that's, the best stories always are. It's at the end. It's like an episode of Seinfeld. They all plots come together. Um, so, 
So what, what, what happened was, it was in that, and so I, really, like, I had all those thoughts sort of and experiences, you know, being lost and lonely in my 20s and really anxious, um, going to business school and realizing just how much money and time it cost for what it was. And then we had this thing where we started to learn classes and they were working really well. And the challenge was that those one-off classes were never gonna be a great big business. They were really interesting, but it was like, I like to say, it was, it was I had this experience because I had worked in the arts a little bit. It was like a really bad off-off Broadway theater. Because like at least an off-off Broadway theater can run the same show for multiple nights, right? We were doing a different show every night with 30 seats trying to sell it out. And it was never gonna become a huge thing. Um, and we were selling it out, but I said, we, we gotta take this to the next level. And it's when I, it was then when I started to sort of put all these threads together. And I said, okay, education is, at least at this level, around when it's about your career and it's about higher education, it's really about return on investment, right, at that stage of your career, in this context. And I, went, um, and I, I said, like, what if we could sort of, if we could sort of transform somebody's pros economic prospects, create a better return, we could rationalize at least some investment and not even require the same level of sort of debt subsidy that the current sort of higher education system runs on. And maybe we could actually convince individuals on their own, in their own dime, right, to come to GA and invest in themselves because the ROI was so high. And so the basic idea was keep the highly relevant skills, keep that, that return very high, but shorten the time and the money. And by lessening the denominator, we could completely like, 10x the return on investment that people could expect out of out of that sort of postgraduate education at this level. I don't want to. You're doing awesome stuff too, but um, <laughs> <laughs> that's good because I was worried that Maria was going to feel inadequate after that. Yeah, well, okay. Anyway, yeah, failure. Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah. So, so that became our first three month course. It was like an experiment. We had no idea what we were doing. We were existing outside any of the sort of existing structures for education. Yeah. And I don't think a lot of people thought that we could pull it off. And we ended up running, and, and we ended up doing you know, web development, then we did UX design, then we did data science, then we did uh, some weird stuff that didn't really work. And then we did more software development, and then we did more data science. And before we knew it, this was we had this model that was um, had you know, classrooms and literally, um, you know, three different continents, and, and today we are in 22 different cities, um, and we have 20 or 50 plus thousand alumni, and, um, and you know, all based on these three-month courses. And that was sort of the origin, and it, it sort of came partly from opportunity, right, that opportunistic moment when we were, we were like just doing this thing, wow, this is working, let's keep writing it. But it was also informed by these personal experiences and passion I had for saying, there's gotta be a better way, right? I, I want to use the opportunistic moment um, that you that you saw as a departure point to talk to Fatima a little bit. <laughs> We're going to come back, I promise. Um, you had this opportunity come to you that until you first heard about it wasn't something you had been planning for. It wasn't a dream or a vision that you had. Can you talk a little bit about your background and how the opportunity emerged for you to attend school? Definitely, thank you. So I, I was, I'm from Kabul, Afghanistan. And when I was two years old, my family decided to go to Pakistan as immigrants because uh, there was civil war going on in Afghanistan. So my family and I, we moved to Pakistan when I was two years old when there was no opportunity for immigrants to get to go to good schools. So I, I grew up in Pakistan. So I was there for nine years of my life. And I attended an immigrant school because the government, we were not allowed to attend government schools. Um, what, sorry, why weren't you allowed to attend government schools? Because immigrants in Pakistan, they don't have any sort of legal status. So if you are not actually from Pakistan, you can't really go to the government schools. And the private schools, my family had no money for that. So I went to, a, I went to an immigrant school just two hours. So a lot of my schooling happened with my family. My dad, he spent all his day teaching all my siblings. I have three sisters and I have a brother, and I am the fourth one. 
of my sisters. So it was right after the fall of Taliban when my family, with the, when the school got closed and the immigrant school, because there weren't a lot of immigrants anymore. So my family moved to Afghanistan again, which was a big deal because it was right after the fall of Taliban. Things didn't change. Um, I mean, the Taliban were gone, but then the education system and everything was just really scattered. So I started going to school, and which was, I again didn't have any sort of like classroom setting. We were like 50 of us would sit in a hallway and then spend two hours to just get education. So again, I, I don't really have a good schooling background just because of the education system. So I, I sort of graduated in 2000, like very late 2008 from school. And I, I mean, I really wanted to go to university, but then there wasn't any university that I could go to. We do have a government university in Afghanistan, but it's really, really, like when you have like 100,000 like students waiting to go to university, then it's really difficult. The situation was still really bad. So I, I basically, I had no way to continue my education. So one day my dad, he heard about Asian University for Women, which is in Chittagong, Bangladesh. And he just heard, he, he told me that, you know, Fatima, you're going to go to this school and they're, gonna, they're giving a scholarship and you no longer need to think about, you can't go to university anymore. And I, I was really nervous and I was like, I'm really young. I can't speak any English. I don't know how to use computers. I don't know how to get into this school. And then my dad was, no, you, you, you will dream big and you will go to this university. So next day, my dad, sent me with my sister to fill, a, fill in the application for AUW. So I, I went there, and then the application process, everything happened. And then I got into this school. 90 of us took the exam, and then nine of us could get selected. And now that I, I knew good English, a lot of this came with math and others. So the exam had all the different sort of questions and everything. So I, I got into the university. So I, I went to Bangladesh for five years. So how, how I cope with all the different language, different culture and everything. So I spent five years in Bangladesh. And the first year that I spent was just like prepared me to get into undergrad. So the first year, the first year I had like English learning, computers, and all the critical thinking subjects that I needed to um, get into the undergrad. So I mean, it's it's a it's a university that I am really proud to be part of. Uh, it just changed my life, and it just helped me to really dream big because wherever I am right now, it's just because of the university that I went to. I, my time at AUW, it just helped me to learn how to be with different cultures, different religion, different, different people. So right now, I, I have no problem. I, I have, there's a big, big uh, like thing inside me that always accepts who, with any differences that we all have. So, and that came with AUW. When, when did you learn to speak English? In 2009. At AUW? <laughs> yes. <laughs> and it was the math that enabled you to score high enough on the test to get you in? I guess so, because my English, I, I didn't know any English. <laughs> yeah. I just knew, I mean, the first day I went to the class and then the teacher asked me, so introduce yourself. And then I stood and I was like, oh my God, I only know how to say it. my name is Fatima. So <laughs> and, it was really hard. <laughs> and what are you doing now? So right now I am, I am finishing up my master's in sustainable development. So I am doing my master's in Vermont at School for International Training. 
Um, I'm just working on my thesis, so I'm done with all the other requirements. And I'm also doing a, an internship with Women for Women International, which basically helps women in different war-torn war countries. And it just provides uh, women access to informal education and then emp empowers them to uh, set up their own small businesses so that they can become economically self-sufficient. So I'm just helping them to uh, add uh, different topics in their curriculum, which includes uh, female genital mutilation, sexual harassment, violence against women, uh, different topics on health and all sorts of things. <laughs> and you led a demonstration back home. Yes. Will you talk about that a little bit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so when I was, um, after I graduated uh, from AUW in 2014, I started working at the Ministry of Counter Narcotics in um, uh, Kabul. Hold on one sec. Just so that we're all clear, you were law enforcement stopping drug trade in Afghanistan. I guess so. <laughs> <laughs> yes, so we so. tried. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if Chris Perino is still around, but I think that's probably what he would say about New Jersey. Yeah? Yeah, we did try. <laughs> so I started working in a ministry where only 5% of the total employee are. When you go to all these big uh, meetings, you, you can only find one or two women who would always sit at the back and so basically, there was a lack of women, women in that ministry. And I guess that was the intention behind like continuing like working there. And I am really proud that I was part of like being able to work there because there's a huge stigma that goes with working with the ministry that deals with drugs. So everybody like my, when I started working there, so everybody would tell me, so you deal with criminals, with all these sorts of people. So they don't find that a good job for women. But then I'm so thankful to my family for allowing me to work there. So I started working there, and we definitely saw a big need to start a campaign which was about um, like anti-sexual harassment campaign. So the harassment, we are talking about different sort of harassment in public places in Afghanistan, which I definite, which I wrote my thesis on when I was graduating. So uh, my friend and I, uh, who is also uh, an AUW graduate, um, her name is Morsal Hamraz, we decided to have a sexual harassment campaign because there were some, there were few things that we really didn't like, which was talking about women's clothing, not, not really like seeing women uh, as uh, people who like need to raise their voice and all those sorts of things. So then we decided to have a campaign which went, our campaign was for one entire day and we started the day with all playing different songs, <laughs> I mean songs about women empowerment um, and then we actually talked about different forms of violence and different, I mean, and then we mainly talked about sexual harassment, which is a topic that nobody talks. So it was, I mean, when we came up with the idea of having sexual harassment campaign, uh, I remember I all the high um, authority people in the ministry, they said, could we change the word sexual to something else? And then, <laughs> and then we said That's no. The problem. <laughs> <laughs> we said no, because because no, I mean, people, we need to. <laughs> I mean, if we don't say that word, we can't be serious about it. And I am really serious about uh, violence against women and how bad it is, and then especially about sexual harassment, because there is no need for harassing women on the streets, you know? Like at home, she did something bad, but what did she do uh, outside home on the streets that you just go? and throw comments at her, like uh, talk bad about with to her. So there is no excuse for changing that word. So we had we had the campaign and which went really well. So we invited all men and women, which is something 
really uh, incredible that uh, you don't see it uh, in Afghanistan happening. We had boards where we asked uh, men and women to come and write about like why sexual harassment happens and uh, why uh, we need to talk about it. And of course, we did have a lot of people coming up and writing that it's women's fault to wear a certain type of clothing or uh, so the blame came on us, but then we, we, we don't take that. We, we, we know that that's, that's absolutely wrong. So, and then we, we thought that, oh, we need to take this conversation to their home. So what we did was we, had, we actually handed a scarf to every employee, and we had for about 500 participants. So we handed a scarf to, uh, to each person who came to the campaign, and we put some messages about we defined sexual harassment. We wrote why uh, harassment is bad, how it, what it does to women, and why we need to deal with it. So we did that with the hope that people would take this conversation at their homes, and then they, they would actually talk about uh, sexual harassment with their family members, which is something that nobody talks. And I mean, people get harassed daily in daily basis, but then everybody is really shy to talk about it. So. That's what the campaign was about. Were you always outspoken? No. <laughs> of course not. <laughs> <laughs> do you blame Kamal for being outspoken? Of course I do. <laughs> well, yeah. So actually, I, I, was, I used to be very shy. So I, I, I can't. I can't I took uh, no believe. responsibility. Yeah, <laughs> I gave you that. So, so actually, let's talk about Kamal a, a little bit. Um, Kamal, you, you won a United Nations Gold Peace Medal, um, among many, many other things. And you have raised uh, a lot of money for the school. That was a dream that you and a co-founder had. Um, You've raised some of that money from Bill and Melinda Gates, some from the State Department, some from just an extraordinary uh, number of and an extraordinary list of donors. Um, tell us a little bit about how you started the university at around the same time Jake was starting General Assembly. Well, uh, <laughs> thank you, thank you, Ed. Um, before I get into the specific question. I also want to acknowledge, um, in addition to Fatima, we have two other graduates, Jampa from Tibet, who is right at the front, and Vilni from Cambodia. I don't know where she is or whether she is right there. Oh, you want to stand up? <laughs> yeah, no, no. Thank you, Dave, for Jampa just graduated also from the School for International Training and uh, Vilni is, a, uh, is doing her PhD at the NYU Medical School in Epidemiology. We are very proud of her graduates. We also have two board members, Ina Anger in the back, professor at Columbia Business School, and up front here, a member of our International Council, Sarah Rosenfield. Um, the, you know, the, I think the beginning was really recognizing that there is a vast problem in the developing world where women are the most un remain the most underutilized resource. And when you top it up with the whole issue of the history of neglect, violence against women, and the potential that if this one group long neglected in society could be educated, empowered, and pathways for them to attain leadership positions could be unveiled, literally, that everything around them could change. And what you see with Fatima and 550 other graduates whom we have educated is the beginnings of that process. Um, you know, raising money for a university in Bangladesh um, for women, especially women who are first generation university entrants, seemed like an impossible idea. Most people we went to uh, said they would. They, they could recognize the importance of educating women at a primary school level, but at a university, certainly that's not feasible. Um, so I think a big part of it was sort of our persistence. One of the first things we had to do was within the country, within Bangladesh, 
uh, we recognized early on that if we are to put together a successful university, it had to have a constitutional structure that allowed it to be successful. Too often in the developing world, the long arm of government gets into every aspect of a university and that makes it impossible for the university to function in the true sense of a, an educational institution. So one of the first things we did is actually craft a charter for this university, which in some sense, when you compare it to sort of structures and ways of organizing academic institutions in the US wouldn't strike you as very different. We asked for academic freedom. We asked for the autonomy to, uh, to run the institution on our own. We asked that the principle of non-discrimination be embedded in, 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 in the outlook for the university. But all of that was actually a radical shift in how universities were perceived. Um, so it took us about four years to get the parliament to ratify an act that would grant us this charter. And it was an interesting debate. Um, it was in a, at a time when the government was in a coalition with a fundamentalist Islamic group. So that particular group really liked that this is a separate women's institution, but did not like that there is a university which focused on leadership, on liberal arts education, and a nexus um, with the international world. And on the left wing, the radicals thought a university for women in the 21st century, that's gotta be a medieval concept, an anachronistic response to modern society's needs, and they will post it. So it took us really four years to bring the very interest groups within the parliament together to ultimately get actually a unanimous um, vote on the charter. And it's then that really the momentum um, for the fundraising came. Gates Foundation was really one of the first uh, foundations to support us. And I think it doesn't even to this day, it doesn't have an international program look focused at higher education, but what they said is that they recognized the power of this institution almost in a way like a technology does, that the power of leaders creating a network of women leaders stand across the Asian and Middle Eastern region, who could then trigger all sorts of other change. And that uh, was really what helped us ultimately launch the university. Uh, with support from the Gates Foundation. Uh, Mr. Soros was uh, also an early supporter. Um, and, you know, I think quite often, at least in the philanthropic world, people forget the importance of, um, of supporting ideas, which may at a certain point seem impossible. But if you don't give that a chance, then the future of, of change becomes kind of endangered. And there's a, there's a fabulous profile of you in the Boston Globe from a few years back, um, which talks about you doing almost something like this, although with secondary education and primary education, where you asked kids that you were tutoring for free to each bring a brick until you could together build a schoolhouse. And I'm wondering if this is the schoolhouse that you've been dreaming about building for 30 years. So well, that's how I got started. Um, um, we, um, there is a colleague of yours who actually grew up on the same university campus uh, where I grew up, where my father, grandfather were professors. It turned out that on this university campus, which was believed, which was viewed as the um, principal echelon for higher education in the country, there were hundreds of children, seven, eight, nine, ten years old, who worked as domestic help. And none of them had any opportunity to get an education. So, for a 13-year-old, as I was, it struck as a grievous anomaly to be at a 
seat of higher learning, and yet in your families and your communities be surrounded by young children who were illiterate. So several of my classmates and I actually did a little survey. We went around the neighborhood and asked whether these families, how many they employed, because this was sort of an invisible community. You never saw these kids out uh, in the public. They were always indoors. And it turned out there were about 200 kids in the neighborhood. And we asked if we set up a school, would you let them go um, for a couple of hours? When would you let them go and so forth? And I think they were sort of puzzled or they certainly didn't take us seriously that for uh, 13 year old kids going around uh, doing a survey were for real. But we managed to actually set up a school, just converting car garages into em empty car garages into classrooms. But when we started the school, soon after we started the school, we were actually shut down by the Neighborhood Welfare Association. They said it was a nuisance to have so many kids coming through the neighborhood. Um, of course, part of the problem was these kids were making friends for the first time as they were coming into the school. They were getting to know other kids. So when we were shut down, we didn't know what to do. We should do how do we continue? But it was there was too much energy to simply shut it down. So we took the kids, 200 kids, to an adjacent empty field and continued our classes really under a tree. And, you know, so every morning, every afternoon for two hours when these kids would come, we said, pick up a brick. Pick up a brick from whatever construction site you pass and bring it. <laughs> um, and ultimately, we had enough of a brick bank to actually take over sites of one of the schools. And we built a school. And it was such a remarkable feat that even though we were entirely an illegal occupant of a, of a street, <laughs> um, we got electricity from the street lamp, um, uh, but nobody really, the, nobody questioned us because the moral aspect of young children, sort of like Soweto in 1976, mm -hmm. when young children get up and claim their moral right, it's very difficult to oppose. Uh, and that's what happened. Um, so that's how we, I got started. So, um, so one of the things I love about the stories that you've each told is, is about the concept of access and about your ability to see people who would be well served by and could actually really avail themselves of the opportunity of an education, um, particularly after the age of 18, um, particularly as, as adults. And Jake, I, I want to just talk a little bit about your, um, your thinking on a global scale, because the other thing with all four of you. Is this just, is global. I don't know what I am, but that's, that's global. I, I, <laughs> it's just how big and audacious the, the thinking is with all four of you. And you want me to comment on it? Well, you. <laughs> You, you raised venture money and opened schools in Singapore, London, yeah. Australia, you know, like, no? No, I mean, sure, I just, I'm, now I'm like, I don't really know if I deserve to talk when I'm up with these people here. <laughs> and so I'm feeling a little Are you weird. having the imposter syndrome? I'm having a total imposter syndrome all the time, which usually doesn't happen to me, but right now, man. Um, well, welcome okay. to the club. Let's talk about, I'm going to shift that a little bit and say global is a very powerful concept. Right, because it still seems, it still see, it feels like we're in this weird interstitial place where we both have access to information and people from places that, I mean, you know, a hundred years ago would have taken, you know, a two month journey to get to and things like that. Um, and and so the global is, is still a very powerful idea because it. And I'll say as an entrepreneur, we loved it because it made us seem bigger than we actually were pretty quickly, right? Because it's like, oh, we're in London, oh, we're in that. Like, yeah. now I will say, I, I really wish we hadn't done it because it's a huge pain in the ass. But like, I, I, I to actually do like accounting and audits and taxes and equity and all that stuff in, in different places, it's I pay you a lot of bills because of that. But <laughs> um, 
What's the point here? So, but my point is, I think there's a, I think there's a lesson here. I think there's a lesson here, which is that, funny. Um, <laughs> uh, my point here is that, and I think my my contribution here is going to be that 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 the power of vision, right? And 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 as leader, as a, a leader that I try to do, um. What is it? Oh, That's not you. Okay, I was like, I didn't say that. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, there's something that, that I, didn't, I don't think I appreciate. I was so focused at the time on trying to be an entrepreneur, and I was really, because of my training, was focused on like finding a little market opportunity and, and getting my unit economics to work and, like, and like kind of proving that I, I could like be a hustler, kind of, you know, in a way, make the whole little machine work, like almost like an engineer. And what I realized once we had like 10, 20 people is that what they really needed was a big common vision to share. And we talk about it a lot, but I will say that like, I was, I was actually a slow adopter of this idea of mission statement, vision statement, you know, values, which, but when I adopted it, I adopted it with force, and I think I, at that point, understood the real reason for it, which is that, for all of these things, and I was really struck with this idea of the, the power of the concept of this university, right? More than the people that you're gonna help, which is awesome, right? It's really awesome. The singular concept is, is leadership, not just for the, the leaders you're creating, but the idea that this exists becomes its own kind of disruptive force in other people's minds, right? And, and I, I think that the, that is like leadership at the highest level, is that, is that, when you have a really powerful concept, something that maybe people hadn't thought was possible before, or didn't occur to them before, or combines things in a different way, um, it really serves to organize people and their, their various passions and emotions and perspectives into a, a somewhat singular force. And if I think about it, like the hardest thing in the world to do is unify even just like two people around a single thing, right? Like it's not easy to do. And what's incredible about the institutions that we create, whether they're non-profit and philanthropic or you know, an institution of higher learning that like, you know, is trying to change the way people think about the sciences or women in the sciences or whatever, is that, is that when you can organize people around this concept, it creates a power all of its own. And that works, at, I think, it's almost like a fractal at every level. In a conversation with a single individual, communicating a vision like that can help a conversation occur. In a small group of people can get everybody sort of working together in a different way. And for a company or a large organization, when you get to 500, 600, thousands of people, it's a necessity. Because if you don't have that common ground and that shared vision, everybody's working in its own way, in their own way. Okay, so I'm going to build on that. Okay. So, um, so I'm one of those people, a lot like my daughter actually, where I, I was convinced from a very young age that I could change the world. I mean, it's embarrassing. Okay. But, you know, I remember walking down the street at the age of seven going, like, I'm going to do great things with my life. <laughs> I'm going to change the world. Okay, this is really, I mean, if I hadn't seen it my daughter, I wouldn't have believed that, you know, it was really possible. Anyhow. So the thing, and so my big passion, as I think many people here knows, is that race, gender, sexual orientation, social class, income level, none of these should have anything to do with who has the possibility of learning and succeeding. And of course, I focus mostly on science and engineering because I grew up as a girl who thought I was a boy. My father thought I was a boy too, which was very fortunate because I, I mean really believed I was a boy. Like the first time I was pregnant, that is not physically possible. <laughs> I was his, the second daughter out of four, and he had really wanted a boy, and I came along, and I really wanted to be a boy, and I was probably like nine before I gave up on waking up the next morning and actually having physically transformed into a boy. But the only things I liked were boy things, so like math, science, playing the trumpet, you know, like dolls. I mean. This is almost as fancy as I get in terms of dressing up. I mean, I just don't like girly things. And so it was very annoying that life was so gendered. 
I'm very annoying to be told I couldn't possibly be good at math, even though everyone knew I was really good at math because I was a girl and there are no good mathematicians, female mathematicians. So from very early on, my really big thing was, look, people who love math or computer science or philosophy or just econ or anything, they come in all different shapes and sciences, shapes and sizes. And <laughs> gender and race, and all these things should mean nothing. Okay, so here's what I learned about changing the world. Having worked really hard on it for a long time. Most important thing you can do is obviously know what it is. And, you know, I think this idea, this revelation you had that there are really are things people need and they could get it in three months, that's huge. It's magical. It just really is because, you know, for so long we tell people, well, if you have calculus and differential equations, mm -hmm, of course you're going to learn how to do this data science stuff. But actually, you can. So if we're going to change the world, the most important thing you can do is connect with people who have, whose vision overlaps with yours. So, you know, all of us actually on this thing, our visions overlap. Right? I mean, they really do. Like, I mean, what the Asian AUW is doing, that's magical. I'm going to come visit. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> well, we're going to have a partnership. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. Yeah. Because, I mean, hopefully we're going to have, you know, we're going to figure out a way to do something together. We overlap. Because we really care about empowering people to get the skills that they need to change the world. We overlap because this guy, so I've never met this guy before. Right? This is my first time ever. It's true. But I started working on this group for diversity and inclusion, oh, third week of July. And I was trying to find people who had something to do with venture, you know, like, I hadn't thought of lawyers at the time. <laughs> no one ever does. <laughs> and you know, having a daughter who went to law school, you know, it's sort of like we do make lawyer jokes in our family. <laughs> you probably do in your family too. But um, very serious business. Yeah. So what I did was at first I reached out to like thirteen of my board members who really are crazy about diversity. And you know, one of them is the VP for engineering at Airbnb, one of them is a VP for engineering at Yelp. Uh, one of them is the person in charge of HR for Accenture. Another one is the CEO of Airware. Um, anyway, I reached out to people I knew and I also reached out to Cheryl uh, Sandberg, who's like my PR agent and <laughs> really, really <laughs> that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, but eventually I got connected to Ed. And as soon as I got on the phone with him, I'm going like, I really like this guy. <laughs> I really like this guy a lot. And he has a totally different network from mine. Yeah, because you know Sheryl Sandberg. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so, my point about changing the world is, like, when you meet people who have different networks from yours, you can leverage what they're doing. That's why I'm here tonight. <laughs> they can leverage what you're doing. And when we do that, that's when we have impact. And that's why, you know, I'm thrilled to have met Jake and Kamal and Fatima. And yeah, I'm thrilled to finally meet this guy face to face. <laughs> um, but I truly believe that that's how we create change, is we make connections we find out what that person can do that this other person can't do. So um, earlier today, I was in a meeting with uh, one of our alums who's on my board, Shamit Grover, who works for MSD Family Foundation. Uh, I adore Shamit. Um, and I said, Shamit, I really need a connection to Lorene Powell Jobs. And the reason I need a connection is because like I'm working on this thing around, uh, so one of my dreams is I'd love to create a lead-like organization to do ratings for uh, 
startups and VCs and law lawyers who work in venture stuff and all that kind of stuff. And I've already talked to Melinda Gates about it. I already have had email exchanges with Priscilla Chan about this and uh, about this general diversity in, in venture kind of space, entrepreneurship space. And Lorene Powell Jobs is sort of the third leg of that stool. Like if you look at the female philanthropists who are really sort of caring about these things. So I, she might say, you know, I think this other board member you have, she might have a, a connection. I emailed her this afternoon from Shamit's office, and I got emailed back, and she said, yeah, I'm good friends with her brother. Uh, I mean, it's just, it's amazing how when you can actually identify the connections you need, and you ask people to help, they actually do help. But, the, but I want to, I want to. Add something there, which is, yeah. and this is sort of something I also tell like recent grads of college when they're like, "What do I do? How do I find my way?" It's that it is much easier to get that access and and to ask people for help and to get it when you know what you want and can communicate it clearly. Yes, right? and it's also easier if you help others. Correct. It's because if you get if you get the reputation for being someone, so I mentor people all over the place. I mostly are women, but not entirely women. Why do I do it? Because I want to create a culture where people believe that you can reach out and ask for help, and people help you. And one of the best ways to do that is help other people, because then they're going to help other people. So I've been waiting for the right opportunity. So I, on Saturday night, my wife and I are hosting Senator Kamala Harris, who we adore. And the person running the event asked me if I would sort of moderate Q&A. And I said, I think I know what you just asked me to do, which is you want me to be the person who cuts off Kamala Harris when she's giving a brilliant essay answer to a question. And there's not a chance in hell I will talk over you know, a, a, woman, a woman like that in, in particular. Um, and there's so much more that I want to hear from each of you. I am going to wrap it up so that we can hear from John Tavius. I do want to end with, with uh, a couple of very quick things. One, which we didn't get to, is I think there's an event in which Maria was involved directly <laughs> that everyone in this room is aware of. And I'll just uh, quickly tell you what it is, because uh, Maria was at the Grace Hopper um, asking. Yeah, I'm wearing the same shirt. <laughs> asking Sachin Nadella uh, about women and the pay gap, and he said that it was a, a woman's superpower to not ask for a raise. And Maria immediately disagreed with him, um, and he later issued an apology. Um, and so that was kind of a little bit of a, a shot heard around the world. Um, okay, I gotta say something. He made a mistake. He acknowledged within a couple of hours that he'd made a mistake and sent a message to every Microsoft employee apologizing for making the mistake. He went back to Microsoft and he says, if I can make that stupid mistake, so can all of my managers. And so we're all going to do diversity and inclusion training for the rest of this week. So I, I am so proud of Sacha. Yes, he screwed up. But you know, one of the ways you tell a leader is when they could admit they made a mistake. And I made a mistake because I talked to them. Which is great. And so I want, I want people afterwards to ask her about comp sci black and comp sci gold at MUD, which I'm sorry we didn't get to talk about. And I want people later to also ask Kamal about how he got Prime Minister Sherry Blair, or Prime Minister's wife, uh, Sherry Blair, and Abe to uh, be so involved, and Laura Bush, be so involved in his organization, because that is also real aisle crossing. Um, and you should definitely talk to Jake about how to raise money, how to grow a team, and how to reinvent yourself. Thank you all so much. Let's go listen to John Taylor. Thank you. Although, when they started talking, I was like, why? Oh, thank you so much. I don't want to be too loud all night. <laughs>
So on the same I, I said, I'm trying to come off and how much harder that is than what I do. So that oh. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm <laughs> sorry. <laughs>